Welcome and thanks for joining for this 15 minute presentation on what you can expect if you are moving to Washington DC and the National Capital Region. Please feel free to pause the presentation at any time if you would like to take a screenshot or write down any of the information presented. Also, please note that the presentation will always be available on YouTube and on the CAF Connection website. I hope that you are excited about this posting opportunity as there are so many things to do and see in the Washington DC area. Keep an eye out for the points uh, that are more of a I wish I knew nature. These points have been gathered from fellow Canadians after settling into the DC area in hopes of easing the transition by avoiding surprises and having realistic expectations for newcomers. So let's get started. There are three different states in the Washington DC area, DC, Maryland, and Virginia. And I'm going to just go over all three of them during this presentation. So District of Columbia, the first one, is a 68 square mile federal district home to the US Capitol, the White House, and the Supreme Court. It's neither a state nor a city, but it's a federal district formed in 1790. All roads lead to the Capitol, which is the building in the dividing center for the quadrants of the city. It's an international city with over 175 countries that have embassies and offices in the area. Another thing to note is the taxation without representation, which is placed on all of the DC um, license plate in the area. And it's true, uh, although there are more than 700,000 permanent residents of the district, they have no elected elected member of Congress to represent them. DC is also home to the National Mall, which is a nearly two mile long park that stretches from the Lincoln Memorial on the Potomac River to the steps of the US Capitol building. In normal years, it receives about 24 million visitors a year. And it is also the setting of many movies, some of which you may have seen recently. One thing that um, you'll note in the District of Columbia is it is the site of many protesters and protesters come to express their political views in the area from one person um, having a peaceful small protest to large protests of over a million people. I'll speak later about protests and Canadians um, in the presentation. Situated in the middle of the East Coast of the United States, Virginia was the location of the first permanent settlement by the English in 1607. The land was originally home to the Cherokee, Powhatan, Manahoac, and several other Native American tribes. The surrenders uh, ending both the American Revolution in Yorktown and the Civil War occurred in Virginia. The Chesapeake Bay Bridge Tunnel, which is one of 12 such complexes in the world, was the world's largest prior to recent construction in China. It's a 17.6 mile or 28.3 kilometer trip across the bay, the Chesapeake Bay. Um, and it actually saves about 153 kilometers of travel if you are to drive all the way around the bay. The subject of a beloved children's book, the Chincoteague Ponies have roamed Assateague Island for centuries. Evidence shows that they are likely survivors of a Spanish galleon ship that sunk off the coast of Virginia and Maryland. The northern part of Assateague Island, where the ponies are, is actually in Maryland, which is our third state in the DMV area. 
home to the U.S. Naval Academy in Annapolis, um, Maryland, uh, or sorry, the U.S. Naval Academy, which was founded in 1845. Maryland is also home to the birthplace of Babe Ruth, who was born in Maryland, and several other baseball stars, including Cal Ripken Jr., Billy Ripken, and Lefty Grove. 16 of the 23 counties in Maryland border on tidal water, and it makes up about 4,431 miles of shoreline in all of the different inlets and outlets along the Chesapeake Bay and also along the Atlantic Ocean. America's national anthem was written by a Maryland lawyer, Francis Scott Key. It is believed he wrote the anthem on September 14th, 1814, while watching the bombardment of Fort McHenry in Baltimore Harbor. The geography of the national capital region is quite varied. Um, there are tidal rivers, as mentioned, in both Maryland and Virginia and the DC area. Um, there's hills and winding roads. In fact, um, it's surprising how hilly the area is. And sometimes these windy roads and the subdivisions are quite narrow. There are numerous equestrian and food producing farms, um, as shown by this one, this picture here. And there are actually cliffs and quite fast moving streams um, and rivers. This is the Potomac River up here in the right corner, um, which separates Maryland on this side and Virginia on this side. And um, at some points it can, the water can raise up to about this area. So it's quite fast moving and quite dangerous at times. Then of course, there's the busy cityscape of Washington DC proper, which is spread out over uh, a large area, which I'll discuss later. So really the, the region has a little bit of everything. As mentioned, the DMV, DC, Maryland, and Virginia area um, is spread out over a large area. And our uh, region makes up over 150,000 square kilometers. Um, coastal plains on the Atlantic Ocean side of the area and the tidal region, which um, goes up along these various rivers and streams as well as the Appalachian or Appalachian, depending on who you're talking to, plateau, which is down in this area of the map. This video will deal with the areas specific to the DC metro area, including Fort Belvoir, Joint Base Meyer Henderson Hall, the Pentagon, Fort McNair, Joint Base Anacostia Bowling, Walter Reed National Medical military medical center and Andrews Air Force Base. Um, and they're spread out throughout the DC area. I'll show you a better picture in a minute. If you're screening for or have been posted to Paxiton River, Quantico Marine Corps Base or the Hampton Roads, Norfolk, Williamsburg area, you may want to check out the living in locations for those or living in for those locations. So again, there's many different bases in the area, in the entire region, um, but we're going to specifically deal with the Washington DC area in this video. So Metro DC is the sixth largest US city um, with over 6 million people in the region. It's the nation's capital, home to headquarters for many organizations and companies, as well as the Pentagon, the Supreme Court, and the United States Capitol building, as mentioned before. As such, it is one of the most educated and affluent areas in the country. DC has a higher cost of living than most Canadian cities, and the housing market for rentals is swift, and rents here can be extremely high. 
you may have a bit of sticker shock when you are looking um, on rental sites for new homes, um, sites like Zillow or uh, Trulia. There are many different um, possibilities when you're searching, but just keep in mind that uh, you will have a rent ceiling that will allow you to rent a house that is comfortable and suitable for your family. So there are pockets of Canadians living in many areas of the city um, and it can make it a little bit difficult to kind of choose your area because there's so many different choices. Um, some reference points when you're looking, um, the Beltway, obviously, it's a large circular highway, the 495, which goes around DC Metro and um, it crosses through all of the states um, that make up the district or surrounds all of the states that make up this area. The Beltway um, has a uh, several different uh, highways that kind of spoke inwards towards the city. Um, one I might recommend that you take a look at is this highway here, which is Highway 66. It's actually a toll highway, um, and I'll talk about it in a little bit, which runs from the outer reaches of the district area for the 495 Beltway, and it actually um, you can travel right into the DC area from there. Uh, the Potomac River crosses on a diagonal all the way down through here, and it separates um, Virginia, Northern Virginia, from Washington, DC, and Maryland. The embassy is kind of right here in between about A and S on this map at the eastern edge of the National Mall. And it is actually in sight of the US Capitol building. You can see it from the embassy. So if you're wondering where you should live, um, it's good to know that families with high school students often, often choose the Western area in Northern Virginia um, close to McLean, Falls Church, which is here, Pimmit, uh, Tysons, and Vienna, which are kind of in this area. And that's because of the higher ranked high schools in the area. Um, and you, so you may want to check those out. Families with younger students tend to live a little bit closer in, in the Arlington, Alexandria area. Single families or couples without children may choose to live in, oops, Alexandria Old Town, oops, there we go, um, which is right here because of the historic buildings, the easy walkability to um, pubs and different food options, or they may tend to live in Arlington, which is also quite popular because of its proximity to downtown DC, um, and metro stations and also restaurants and things like that. Lastly, French language families um, often lived in, in the Bethesda, Chevy Chase, Silver Spring area because the Lycée, Lycée Rochambeau is in this area and many Francophone families, both Canadian and um, French families from France and other countries tend to live in that area. Wherever you live, I highly recommend you connect with your MFS coordinator to help connect you with a family of similar demographic so you can discuss and make informed choices about numerous things in your area through our sponsor program. Again, we aim to give you the tools to decide, but the decision is yours. Please note, I or your MFS coordinator do not have access to rent ceilings or information on house, house sizing. And I caution you on using the information provided to you by others who have had outcamp postings. This information is very specific to you, to your location, and to the current economy 
and will be provided to you once you receive your posting message by CDLS Washington and BGRS. So one of the things that's slightly different about uh, military family services or MFS in the US is there is no MFRC building, no physical building in the region. And there's only one staff member, your MFS coordinator. Depending on volunteers um, is something that we must do because uh, we're a one person staff. And we also depend on local US bases to provide services to OutCan families in the area. There are, as mentioned before, there are many bases spread out over the DMV. And this is just a few of them that I've mentioned. Um, in order to get access to the base, um, the first time that you go on will require your military ID, um, a passport, uh, a posting message, and sometimes a letter from the military members commanding officer or their um, facility that they work for. So it's a little bit more difficult to get on the base, but once you're registered, you should have access um, with just your DEERS card, which is um, your military access card, or CAC for the military member. Gyms, tickets, and other things um, on base are open to Canadians, um, just like dependents of US uh, military. It, it can be daunting the first time that you go on a base because the security is so tight um, and you'll be met um, by uh, military police officers, uh, which will be very specific with what they're requiring. And sometimes it may take you retreated tip, trips to register, or you may be able to access at one point and then perhaps a few weeks down the road, you may not. Um, just be patient. Um, you are allowed access, but sometimes you may have to repeat, repeat steps um, because their system is slightly different than ours. Just like in Canada, thriving in the US means getting to know your local base. So check out what's close to you um, base wise. This um, diagram here shows the military treatment facilities or MTFs um, on the different bases in our region. And generally Canadians are entitled to use these military treatment facilities. Um, and there's more about healthcare online on the CAF Connection website. Um, the two major centers that most people use are the Fort Belvoir Community Hospital here and Walter Reed Military Medical Center here. And they have almost all of the services that you could require, including civilian pediatrics um, and women's health. So just keep an eye on these kind of things. This is what they offer in their region. Um, it is subject to change, but you want to keep an eye on this. So as I mentioned, there are many bases in the area. We're going to just review two of the ones that are most frequently used by Canadians. The most central base families use is Joint Base Meyer Henderson Hall. It wraps around the Arlington National Cemetery, which is kind of here in the middle, and is quite close to the Pentagon and downtown DC. It houses a commissary um, over here um, and two different exchanges, um, one on this side here and one right by the main gate, um, a military treatment facility, the Raider Clinic, and other morale and welfare offices, including a bowling alley, tickets office, and um, there's also a gas station here. 
One of the cool things about Joint Base Meyer Henderson Hall is it's also home to the Old Guard Caisson Stables, which houses the horses which pull fallen soldiers to their final resting place in the Arlington National Cemetery. And in normal times, you can actually go in and get a tour of the stables, which is kind of nice. The second base I wanted to just go over quickly is Fort Belvoir. It's just, just southwest of the city near Springfield, Virginia. And some families like to use it for its commissary facilities and its PX shopping mall, um, as well as the community hospital, which I've also mentioned. But it also has an outdoor rec area with a campground um, and access to a boat launch. And you can also rent um, outdoor rec uh, items such as actually pull behind tent trailers or campers. So you may want to check that out once you get here. Some of the main concerns at the majority of locations across the US for OutCan Can Canadians uh, are listed here. Um, if you are considering having a baby while you're out of country in uh, the US, you may want to uh, pay attention to the citizenship paperwork that needs to be done and some of the other requirements in order to um, maintain Canadian citizenship for your child. Uh, depending on what visa you're on or where you're posted, things may be slightly different. So just keep that in mind. Childcare, we are not usually able to access the childcare facilities on the bases here because they are first come first serve and the military members um, that are U U.S. forces, they have first dibs at the child care spots. So um, you can contact me and I'll help you find resources for child care or ask around to some of the families that are down here now. I'll talk about education in a little bit. Um, one of the other things that most people, um, one of their concerns is employment. Uh, for spouses and teens. In order to work in the US, you must have a employment authorization document, which you cannot apply for until you cross the border as you move. Um, this is a US document, it's not a Canadian document, so there is nothing that CDLS can do to speed up the process, and it often takes four to six months um, right now to receive this document. So just keep that in mind. There may be a lag in employment. Um, spouses have had problems with employment insurance in the past, and we are working with um, you to help access employment insurance in the future. Finances, um, please uh, keep in mind that the exchange rate uh, fluctuates while you're down here, and this is a quite an affluent area. So you may want to consider your budget and make sure when you're doing so that you consider the exchange rate. Healthcare is a whole different ball game, um, and taxes as well, um, which we have for actually for all of these outcome challenges, we have frequently asked questions, documents and information on the CAF Connection website. Um, please check out the resources on the CAF Connection that we've provided for you there. So I'm gonna get a little bit more in depth into the differences from Canada in our specific region. Um, so when you ask people what the biggest difference is or what the kind of biggest ugly in the good, bad and ugly for the DC area. Washington has a very large traffic problem. It has, as I mentioned, about 700,000 um, permanent residents in the district, but commuters from the surrounding Maryland and Virginia suburbs raise the city's population to over a million during the work week. 
So all of these people are trying to go into work during the morning hours and come back across bridges um, and small highways after work. So traffic is bad here. Your commute has to be a consideration of where you live. Just because traffic is good midday does not mean it will be good during rush hour. So it's a good suggestion if you are able to do an in-person HHT to drive during rush hour from your region to um, wherever you're working and then the same on your commute home. You can also do this by just Google directioning it or checking um, online during rush hour times if you're doing a virtual HHT. There can be more than a half an hour fluctuation in times. Um, and kind of one thing to keep in mind during rush hour, the Beltway is a kind of hour out from the embassy during rush hour. It could be more, it could be less, but I would guesstimate about an hour. Another thing to note, the highway, Highway 66 is a toll highway. Uh, so remember this when planning your route and during rush hour, the, which is peak time, the toll on Highway 66 can reach more than $40 for a one-way 12-mile commute, and that's 12 American, so it's a significant difference. Note also that indicators or blinkers seem to be a suggestion down here, not a requirement, and you'll need to drive cautiously, and you'll need to keep that in mind if you have uh, teens who are going to be uh, writing for their driver's license while they're down here. Uh, education is another big difference. Uh, homework, sports schedules, and expectations are very intense here. They start at a young age and tend to get even more stressful in high school. Lunch times are short. Some schools give only 20 minutes for their elementary aged kids to eat, play, and return to class. And recesses often just don't exist or they are outside for even less time than you would be used to in Canada. Schools in the region do have high ratings and this can result in a lot of pressure for the school to achieve. They want to keep those high ratings and that means high test scores are expected. Some kids thrive, but some kids struggle. Just like a posting in Canada, if there's a pre-existing educational issue, it can be magnified with the difference in teaching methods and testing methods down here. It's important to have an open conversation with your child's potential new school and with your child as well so that you can mitigate any of these struggles early on. To be blunt, do not assume that your child will transition easily. Some students may need extra tutoring or even extra courses like US government to graduate on top of already strong and overwhelming course loads. High school students almost always have difficulty with US math. And I'm, I'm gonna repeat that. Your US or your high school student will have problems with US math and will likely need extra preparation before they start in the fall. And they may need extra tutoring after they do. Um, some high schools will require your children to take math placement tests and they may recommend a lower level to accommodate for the differences and this can in turn affect um, applications for universities is that something you have to keep in mind so be prepared to do extra work to catch them up math is taught in a chunk here so algebra in grade eight and nine geography in grade nine and ten instead of as an overall subject math and students coming from Canada have gaps in their learning that teachers generally will not take the time to fill in so there could be a drop in their, you know, in their grades from straight A's to sometimes barely passing at first. Um, if your child is doing poorly in school during their first year in the US, you can apply to have CEM reimburse tutoring costs, but it's best to plan ahead as low marks can be very challenging for teens as they apply for post-secondary. 
With regards to French, your student will be entitled to schooling in the same language that they were in attending in Canada. So if your student is in French immersion, they will actually be studying in English only in DC and Virginia. Because core French classes are often a lower level than in Canada, your child will be eligible for reimbursement of reasonable tutoring expenses in French. There are a few French immersion elementary schools and no immersion high schools in the DMV. If you have a student being taught in full French in Canada, there is, as I mentioned, a French school here that they may be eligible to attend. Please contact your CEM guidance counselor and the education administrator at CDLS Washington before planning on a specific school. Um, Two other quick points, gun laws. Each state has its own gun laws. Some states have open carry laws and it's not uncommon for American families to have loaded guns accessible in their homes. So please have a conversation with your young children before they visit the home of their American friends and emphasize the importance of gun safety in the homes and of, of others. Lastly, you will talk with many polarized and passionate neighbors and the news down here is very biased. Election years bring out the potential for strong clashes of opinion. And as I'm sure you've heard, the 2020 election year was no exception. As guests in the country, Canadian families are strongly discouraged from commenting on, participating in, or even being present at rallies, demonstrations, protests, and other occurrences which happen on a very regular basis in downtown DC. Sometimes these protests become violent and turn into riots. Um, it's a reminder as well that Canadian families are guests and ambassadors for Canada while out can, and they fall under the responsibility of their local, local Canadian commander while out can. More of this can be found in your welcome book. Just a few quick notes on the climate down here. Um, we have very hot and humid summers, which can bring on strong thunderstorms. And they're quite spectacular actually at times. Your cell phone will ring quite frequently during the summer for storm related risks, um, tornado warnings occasionally, danger from falling tree limbs and flash flooding. Please figure out contingency plans for these risks in your home and in your area. Snow is not uncommon here, or sorry, snow is not common here. So a small amount of snow can be a huge problem. The city shuts down and schools are canceled with a small amount of snow on the ground. You may be able to drive in it, but the locals are not familiar with winter driving. So please keep that in mind and be safe. DC is also in a hurricane zone, not as frequently as other areas south as, of us, but they do reach us. Um, between June and November is this the hurricane se season. Um, and over the past few years, there seems to be more and more frequent hurricanes. So it's quite possible that could one could come this way. They also tend to spin off tornadoes. Um, and flash flooding is quite common in the DC area, so keep that in mind. While you're posted to the US, our goal as military family services is to provide you and your family with the support and information we have to make this posting the best it can be. We hope we can ease the transition between Canada and the US and help you settle and thrive in your new community. Our programs and services are developed or identified in the community to meet the needs of our Canadian Armed Forces families posted to the US. These are some of the things that we do to help you to transition downwards, as well as thrive while you're on uh, location here in the DC area. Here is the local military family services community coordinator contact information. Um, they can help you with questions that you may have and provide you with the information needed 
to help you move to the DC area. Once you have your posting message, please contact me or the Military Family Services Coordinator listed above, and they'll be happy to add you to the secret Facebook group and local email distribution list so that you'll start receiving news programs and local information. Thanks so much for watching. We hope that this helps prepare you for your posting to the DC area. The city really does have so much to offer and it's a wonderful posting opportunity. You'll discover while you're down here that we have a strong supportive Canadian community and we look forward to welcoming you and your family. For more information, you can check out CAF Connection, United States, um, and the DC and Virginia region uh, at the address lo located here, or email mfs.washington at cfmws.com. Thank you.